Chapter Ten of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Ten. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Ten, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Ten the fall of the rebel capital since the visit of blair and the return of the rebel commissioners from the hampton roads conference no event of special significance had excited the authorities or people of richmond february and march passed away in the routine of war and politics which at the end of four years had become familiar and dull to shrewd observers in that city things were going from bad to worse stevens the confederate vice-president had abandoned the capital and the cause and retired to georgia to await the end judge john a campbell though performing the duties of assistant secretary of war made among his intimate friends no concealment of his opinion that the last days of the confederacy had come the members of the rebel congress adjourning after their long and fruitless winter session gave many indications that they never expected to reassemble a large part of their winter's work had been to demonstrate without direct accusation that it was the confederate maladministration which was wrecking the southern cause on his part jefferson davis prolonged their session a week to send them his last message a dry lecture to prove that the blame rested entirely on their own shoulders the last desperate measure of rebel statesmanship the law to permit masters to put their slaves into the southern armies to fight for the rebellion was so palpably illogical and impracticable that both the rebel congress and the rebel president appeared to have treated it as the merest legislative rubbish or else the latter would scarcely have written in the same message after stating that much benefit is anticipated from this measure that the people of the confederacy can be but little known to him who it supposes it possible they would ever consent to purchase at the cost of degradation and slavery permission to live in a country garrisoned by their own negroes and governed by officers sent by the conqueror to rule over them jefferson davis was strongly addicted to political contradictions but we must suppose that even his cross-eyed philosophy capable of detecting that a negro willing to fight in slavery in preference to fighting in freedom was not a very safe reliance for southern independence the language as he employs it here fitly closes the continuous official confederate wail about northern subjugation northern despotism northern barbarity northern atrocity and northern inhumanity which rings through his letters speeches orders messages and proclamations with monotonous dissonance during his whole four years of authority of all the southern people none were quite so blinded as those of richmond their little bubble of pride at being the confederate capital was ever iridescent with the brightest hopes they had no dream that the visible symbols of confederate government upon which their eyes had nourished their faith would disappear almost as suddenly as if an earthquake had swallowed them poverty distress and desolation had indeed crept into their homes but the approach had been slow and mitigated by the exaltations of a heroic self-sacrifice all accounts agree that when on sunday morning april two eighteen sixty five the people of richmond went forth to their places of worship they had no thought of imminent calamity the ominous signs of such a possibility had escaped their attention a few days before mrs jefferson davis with her children had left richmond for the south and sent a part of her furniture to auction so also several weeks before the horses remaining in the city had been impressed to collect the tobacco into convenient warehouses where it could be readily burned to prevent its falling into yankee hands but the significance of these and perhaps other indications 
could not be measured by the general populace in fact for some days a rather unusual quiet had prevailed that morning jefferson davis was in his pew at st paul's church when before the sermon was ended an officer walked up the aisle and handed him a telegram from general lee at petersburg dated at half past ten that morning in which he read quote, my lines are broken in three places richmond must be evacuated this evening unquote. he rose and left the church whereupon the officer handed the telegram to the rector who as speedily as possible brought the services to a close making the announcement that general ewell the commander at richmond desired the military forces to assemble at three o'clock in the afternoon the news seems also to have reached in some form one or two of the other churches so that though no announcement of the fact was made the city little by little became aware of the impending change the fact of its being sunday with no business going on and rest pervading every household doubtless served to moderate the shock to the public yet very soon the scene was greatly transformed from the sabbath stillness of the morning the streets became alive with bustle and activity jefferson davis had called his cabinet and officials together and the hurried packing of the confederate archives for shipment was soon in progress citizens who had the means made hasty preparations for flight the far greater number who were compelled to stay were in a flutter to devise measures of protection or concealment the banks were opened and depositors flocked thither to withdraw their money and valuables a remnant of the virginia legislature gathered in the representatives hall at the capitol to debate a question of greater urgency than had ever before taxed their wisdom or eloquence in another room sat the municipal council for once impressed with the full weight of its responsibility meanwhile the streets were full of hurrying people of loaded wagons of galloping military officers conveying orders one striking sketch of that wild hurry scurry deserves to be recorded Quote, lumpkin who for many years had kept a slave trader's jail also had a work of necessity on hand fifty men women and children who must be saved to the missionary institution for the future enlightenment of africa although it was the lord's day perhaps he was comforted by the thought that the better the day the better the deed the coffle gang was made up in the jail yard within pistol shot of davis's parlor window within a stone's throw of the monumental church and a sad and weeping throng chained two and two the last slave coffle that shall ever tread the streets of richmond were hurried to the danville depot unquote but the institution like the confederacy was already in extremis the account adds that the departing trains could afford no transportation for this last slave cargo and the gang went to pieces like every other richmond organization military and political evening had come and the confusion of the streets found its culmination at the railroad depots military authority made room for the fleeing president and his cabinet and department officials and their boxes of more important papers the cars were overcrowded and overloaded long before the clamoring multitude and piles of miscellaneous baggage could be got aboard and by the occasional light of lanterns flitting hither and thither the wheezing and coughing trains moved out into the darkness the legislature of virginia and the governor of the state departed in a canal boat towards lynchburg all available vehicles carrying fugitives were leaving the city by various country roads but the great mass of the population unable to get away had to confront the dread certainty that only one night remained before the appearance of a hostile army with the power of death and destruction over them and their homes how this power might be exercised present signs were none too reassuring since noon when the fact of evacuation had become certain the whole fabric of society seemed to be crumbling to pieces military authority was concentrating its energy on only two objects destruction and departure the civil authority was lending a hand for the single hasty precaution which the city council could ordain 
was that all the liquors in the city should be emptied out to order this was one thing to have it rigorously executed would be asking quite too much of the lower human appetites and while some of the street gutters ran with alcohol enough was surreptitiously consumed to produce a frightful state of excitement and drunkenness no picture need be drawn of the possibilities of violence and crime which must have haunted the timid watchers in richmond who listened all night to the shouts the blasphemy the disorder that rose and fell in the streets or who furtively noted the signs of pillage already begun and how shall we follow their imagination passing from these acts of the friends of yesterday to what they might look for from the enemies expected to-morrow and there was that final horror of horrors the negro soldiers held up to their dread by the presidential message of jefferson davis only two weeks before what now of the fear of servile insurrection the terrible spectre they had secretly nursed from their very childhood it is scarcely possible they can have escaped such meditations even though already weary and exhausted with the surprises and labors of the day with the startling anxieties of the evening with the absorbing care of burying their household silver and secreting their yet more precious personal ornaments and tokens of affection in europe a thousand wars have rendered such experiences historically commonplace in america let us hope that a thousand years of peace may render their repetition impossible full of dangerous portent as had been the night the morning became yet more ominous long before day sleepers and watchers alike were startled by a succession of explosions which shook every building the military authorities were blowing up the vessels in construction at the river these were nine in number three of them ironclads of four guns each the others small wooden ships next the arsenal was fired and as many thousands of loaded shells were stored here there succeeded for a period the sounds of a continuous cannonade already fire had been set to the warehouses containing the collected tobacco and cotton among which loaded shells had also been scattered to ensure more complete destruction there is a conflict of testimony as to who is responsible for the deplorable public calamity which ensued the rebel congress had passed a law ordering the government tobacco and other public property to be burned and jefferson davis states that the general commanding had advised with the mayor and city authorities about precautions against a conflagration on the other hand lieutenant general ewell the military commander has authorized the statement that he not only earnestly warned the city authorities of the certain consequences of the measure but that he took the responsibility of disobeying the law and military orders i left the city about seven o'clock in the morning he writes as yet nothing had been fired by my orders yet the buildings and depot near the railway bridge were on fire and the flames were so close as to be disagreeable as i rode by them by this time the spirit of lawlessness and hunger for pillage had gained full headway the rear guard of the retreating confederates set the three great bridges in flames and while the fire started at the four immense warehouses and various points and soon uniting in an uncontrollable conflagration was beginning to eat out the heart of the city a miscellaneous mob went from store to store and with a beam for a battering ram smashed in the doors so that the crowd might freely enter and plunder the contents this rapacity first directed towards bread and provision stores gradually extended itself to all other objects until mere greed of booty rather than need or usefulness became the ruling instinct and promoted the waste and destruction of that which had been stolen into this pandemonium of fire and license there came one additional terror to fill up its dramatic completeness about ten o'clock writes an eyewitness just before the entrance of the federal army a cry of dismay rang all along the streets which were out of the track of the fire and i saw a crowd of leaping shouting demons in party-colored clothes and with heads half-shaven 
it was the convicts from the penitentiary who had overcome the guard set fire to the prison and were now at liberty many a heart which had kept its courage to this point quailed at the sight fortunately they were too intent upon securing their freedom to do much damage it is quite probable that the magnitude and rapidity of the disaster served in a measure to mitigate its evil results the burning of seven hundred buildings comprising the entire business portion of richmond warehouses manufactories mills depots and stores all within the brief space of a day was a visitation so sudden so unexpected so stupefying as to overawe and terrorize even wrongdoers and made the harvest of plunder so abundant as to serve to scatter the mob and satisfy its rapacity to quick repletion before a new hunger could arise assistance protection and relief were at hand the mayor and citizens committee who went forth met general weitzel a little before seven o'clock in the morning near gillis creek outside the limits of richmond where a detachment of union pickets numbering sixty or seventy men under command of lieutenant royal b prescott had also arrived here an informal surrender took place a ceremony which was repeated with more formality in the capital at a later hour this incident over the general and his staff proceeded into the city followed by lieutenant prescott and his force and preceded by a squad of the general's orderlies from the fourth massachusetts cavalry commanded by major a h stevens and established headquarters in the house lately occupied by jefferson davis lieutenant prescott reached capitol square soon after seven o'clock at that hour there was no flag flying but major stevens soon arrived and hoisted two cavalry guidons over the state house meanwhile from the meeting at gillis creek and probably on information gathered from the mayor general weitzel had sent an aide back with orders to get the first brigade he could find and bring it in to act as provost guard this proved to be general e h ripley's brigade of general charles devon's division of the twenty fourth army corps the brigade was headed by general devon's with the thirteenth new hampshire volunteers as its leading regiment and marched into the city with colors flying and bands playing reaching the capitol grounds a little after eight o'clock from where the forces were sent in various directions on the urgent duties of the hour soon afterward there occurred what was to the inhabitants the central incident of the day the event which engrossed their solicitude even more than the vanished rebel government the destroyed city or the lost cause general weitzel's direction calling in the provost guard had been accompanied by another that all the rest of his troops should remain outside the city to take possession of the inner line of redoubts this second order however failed to reach the fifth massachusetts cavalry a colored regiment under command of colonel charles francis adams posted on the extreme right of the union line who instead obeyed an earlier request from general devins to advance into the city and this colored regiment therefore led by a grandson of president john quincy adams shared with the six white regiments of general ripley's brigade the honor of a march into the rebel capital on the day of its surrender the arrival of these colored soldiers was to the people of richmond the visible realization of the new order to which four years of rebellion and war had brought them the prejudices of a lifetime cannot be instantly overcome and the rebels of richmond doubtless felt that this was the final drop in their cup of misery and that their subjugation was complete it is related that about this time as by a common impulse the white people of richmond disappeared from the streets and the black population streamed forth with an apparently instinctive recognition that their day of jubilee had at last arrived to see this compact organized body of men of their own color on horseback in neat uniforms with flashing sabers with the gleam of confidence and triumph in their eyes 
was a palpable living reality to which their hope and pride long repressed gave instant response they greeted them with expressions of welcome in every form cheers shouts laughter and a rattle of exclamations as they rushed along the sides of the streets to keep pace with the advancing column and feast their eyes on the incredible sight while the black union soldiers rose high in their stirrups and with waving swords and deafening huzzas acknowledged the fraternal reception but there was little time for holiday enjoyment the conflagration was roaring destruction was advancing fury of fire blackness of smoke crash of falling walls obstruction of debris confusion helplessness danger seemed everywhere the great capitol square on the hill had become the refuge of women and children and the temporary storing place of the few household effects they had saved from the burning from this center where the stars and stripes again floated there now flowed back upon the stricken city not the doom and devastation for which its people looked but the friendly help and protection of a generous army bringing them peace and the spirit of a benevolent government tendering them forgiveness and reconciliation up to this time it would seem that not an organization had been proposed and but feeble efforts made to stay the ravages of the flames the public spirit of richmond was crushed by the awful catastrophe the advent of the union army breathed a new life into this social paralysis the first care of the officers was to organize resistance to fire to re-establish order and personal security and convert the unrestrained mob of whites and blacks into a regulated energy to save what remained of the city from the needless burning and pillage to which its own friends had devoted it against remonstrance and against humanity and this was not all beginning that afternoon and continuing many days these yankee invaders fed the poor of richmond and saved them from starvation to which the law of the confederate congress relentlessly executed by the confederate president and some of his subordinates exposed them end of chapter ten recording by warren cotty gurney illinois Chapter 11 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 10, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 11. Lincoln in Richmond. A little more than two months before these events, President Lincoln had written to General Grant, please read and answer this letter as though i was not president but only a friend my son now in his twenty-second year having graduated at harvard wishes to see something of the war before it ends i do not wish to put him in the ranks nor yet to give him a commission to which those who have already served long are better entitled and better qualified to hold could he without embarrassment to you or detriment to the service go into your military family with some nominal rank i and not the public furnishing his necessary means if no say so without the least hesitation because i am as anxious and as deeply interested that you shall not be encumbered as you can be yourself grant replied as followed your favor of this date in relation to your son serving in some military capacity is received i will be most happy to have him in my military family in the manner you propose the nominal rank given him is immaterial but i would suggest that of captain as i have three staff officers now of considerable service in no higher grade indeed i have one officer with only the rank of lieutenant who has been in the service from the beginning of the war this however will make no difference and i would still say give the rank of captain please excuse my writing on a half sheet i have no resource but to take the blank half of your letter the president's son therefore became a member of grant's staff with the rank of captain and acquitted himself of the duties of that station with fidelity and honor 
we may assume that it was the anticipated important military events rather than the presence of captain robert t lincoln at grant's headquarters which induced the general on the twentieth of march eighteen sixty five to invite the president and mrs lincoln to make a visit to his camp near richmond and on the twenty second they and their younger son thomas nicknamed tad proceeded in the steamer river queen from washington to city point where general grant with his family and staff were occupying a pretty group of huts on the bank of the james river overlooking the harbor which was full of vessels of all classes both war and merchant with wharves and warehouses on an extensive scale here making his home on the steamer which brought him the president remained about ten days enjoying what was probably the most satisfactory relaxation in which he had been able to indulge during his whole presidential service it was springtime and the weather was moderately steady his days were occupied visiting the various camps of the great army in company with the general he was a good horseman records a member of the general staff and made his way through swamps and over corduroy roads as well as the best trooper in the command the soldiers invariably recognized him and greeted him wherever he appeared amongst them with cheers that were no lip service but came from the depth of their hearts many evening hours were passed with groups of officers before roaring campfires where mr lincoln was always the magnetic centre of genial conversation and lively anecdote the interest of the visit was further enhanced by the arrival at city point on the evening of march twenty seventh of general sherman who having left general schofield to command in his absence made a hasty trip to confer with grant he was able to gratify the president with a narrative of the leading incidents of his great march from atlanta to savannah and from savannah to goldsboro north carolina in one or two informal interviews in the after cabin of the river queen lincoln grant sherman and rear admiral porter enjoyed a frank interchange of opinion about the favorable prospects of early and final victory and of the speedy realization of the long hoped for peace sherman and porter affirm that the president confided to them certain liberal views on the subject of reconstructing state governments in the conquered states which do not seem compatible with the very guarded language of mr lincoln elsewhere used or recorded by him it is fair to presume that their own enthusiasm colored their recollection of the president's expressions though it is no doubt true that he spoke of his willingness to be liberal to the verge of prudence and that he even gave them to understand that he would not be displeased at the escape from the country of jefferson davis and other principal rebel leaders on the twenty ninth of march the party separated sherman returning to north carolina and grant starting on his final campaign to appomattox five days later grant informed mr lincoln of the fall of petersburg and on his request the president made a flying visit to that town for another brief conference with the general here also amid the wildest enthusiasm the president again reviewed the victorious regiments of grant marching through petersburg in pursuit of lee the capture of richmond was hourly expected and that welcome information reached lincoln after his return to city point between the receipt of this news and the following forenoon but before any information of the great fire had been received a visit to richmond was arranged for the president and admiral porter ample precautions were taken at the start the president went in the river queen with her escort the bat admiral porter went in his flagship the malvern the transport columbus carried a small cavalry escort and ambulances for the party a tug used at city point to convey the president to and from the landing to the river queen at her anchorage in the harbor also went along the little flotilla steamed cautiously up the james river beyond drury's bluff distant twenty-eight to thirty miles from city point by the very tortuous windings of the river some distance above drury's bluff the rebels had obstructed the stream by formidable rows of piling leaving only a small passage which they could easily close if necessary arriving at these obstructions the further progress of the larger vessels was for the moment found impossible admiral farragut visited richmond immediately after its fall and on this morning of april fourth came down from that city to meet the president on the rebel flag of truce boat allison which had escaped destruction by an accident to her machinery the allison had swung across the opening in the piles and was held in place by the current instead of patiently waiting until she could be moved it was resolved to proceed without the vessels the presidential party was transferred to the twelve-oared barge of admiral porter 
a guard of twenty or thirty marines was put aboard the tug and the tug taking the barge in tow managed to pass through the openings in the piles partly obstructed by the allison but when the obstructions had been passed the president insisted that the tug should return and help the allison out of her difficulty in doing this the tug got aground and the mishap left the party no alternative but to proceed in the barge rowed by the admiral's twelve sailors without other escort of any kind and in this manner the president travelled the remaining distance to richmond no accident befell them they passed the suburb of rockets and proceeded to the neighborhood of the manchester bridge effecting a landing one square above libby prison where there was neither officer nor wagon nor escort to meet and receive them never in the history of the world did the head of a mighty nation and the conqueror of a great rebellion enter the captured chief city of the insurgents in such humbleness and simplicity as the party stepped from the barge they found a guide among the contrabands who quickly crowded the streets for the probable coming of the president had been circulated through the city ten of the sailors armed with carbines were formed as a guard six in front and four in rear and between these the party consisting of the president admiral porter captain c b penrose of the army captain a h adams of the navy and lieutenant w w clemens of the signal corps placed themselves all being on foot and in this order the improvised street procession walked a distance of perhaps a mile and a half to the centre of richmond it was a long and fatiguing march the probability of which had not been foreseen at starting we quote from a private letter of captain penrose written on april tenth eighteen sixty five a vivid description of its attendant scenes on tuesday we started for richmond and arrived there just thirty-six hours after jefferson davis had left here again was a perfect ovation of blacks and poor whites the boat with our escort ran aground so we pulled up to the city in admiral porter's barge when we arrived there was a rush for the president and as we had but ten sailors as a guard and had to walk over a mile and a half to headquarters it seemed foolhardy in the president to go however we went through without accident but i never passed a more anxious time than in this walk in going up and we were amongst the very first boats we ran the risk of torpedoes and the obstructions but i think the risk the president ran in going through the streets of richmond was even greater and shows him to have great courage the streets of the city were filled with drunken rebels both officers and men and all was confusion a large portion of the city was still on fire the imagination may easily fill up the picture of a gradually increasing crowd principally of negroes following the little group of marines and officers with the tall form of the president in its centre and having learned that it was indeed mr lincoln give an expression to wonder joy and gratitude in a variety of picturesque emotional ejaculations peculiar to the coloured race and for which there was ample time while the little procession made its tiresome march whose route cannot now be traced at length the party reached the headquarters of general weitzel established in the very house occupied by jefferson davis as the presidential mansion of the confederacy and from which he had fled less than two days before here mr lincoln was glad of a chance to sit down and rest and a little later to partake of refreshments which the general provided an informal reception chiefly of union officers naturally followed and later in the afternoon general weitzel went with the president and admiral porter in a carriage guarded by an escort of cavalry to visit the capital the burnt district libby prison castle thunder and other points of interest about the city and of this afternoon drive also no narrative in detail by an eye-witness appears to have been written at the time it was probably before the president went on this drive that there occurred an interview on political topics which forms one of the chief points of interest connected with his visit judge john a campbell rebel assistant secretary of war remained in richmond when on sunday night the other members of the confederate government fled and on tuesday morning he reported to the union military governor general g f shepley and informed him of his submission to the military authorities learning from general shepley that mr lincoln was at city point he asked permission to see him this application was evidently communicated to mr lincoln for shortly after his arrival a staff officer informed campbell that the requested interview would be granted and conducted him to the president at the general's headquarters where it took place 
the rebel general j r anderson and others were present as friends of the judge and general weitzel as the witness of mr lincoln campbell as spokesman told the president that the war was over and made inquiries about the measures and conditions necessary to secure peace speaking for virginia he urged him to consult and counsel with her public men and her citizens as to the restoration of peace civil order and the renewal of her relations as a member of the union in his pamphlet written from memory long afterwards campbell states that mr lincoln replied that my general principles were right the trouble was how to apply them and no conclusion was reached except to appoint another interview for the following day on board the malvern this second interview was accordingly held on wednesday april fifth campbell taking with him only a single citizen of richmond as the others to whom he sent invitations were either absent from the city or declined to accompany him general weitzel was again present as a witness the conversation apparently took a wide range on the general topic of restoring local governments in the south in the course of which the president gave judge campbell a written memorandum embracing an outline of conditions of peace which repeated in substance the terms he had proffered the rebel commissioners of whom campbell was one at the hampton roads conference on the third of february eighteen sixty five the only practical suggestion which was made has been summarized as followed by general weitzel in a statement written from memory as the result of the two interviews mr campbell and the other gentlemen assured mr lincoln that if he would allow the virginia legislature to meet it would at once repeal the ordinance of secession and that then general robert e lee and every other virginian would submit that this would amount to the virtual destruction of the army of northern virginia and eventually to the surrender of all the other rebel armies and would ensure perfect peace in the shortest possible time out of this second conference which also ended without result president lincoln thought he saw an opportunity to draw an immediate and substantial military benefit on the next day april sixth he wrote from city point where he had returned the following letter to general weitzel which he immediately transmitted to the general by the hand of senator morton s wilkinson in whose presence he wrote it and who was on his way from city point to richmond it has been intimated to me that the gentlemen who have acted as the legislature of virginia in support of the rebellion may now desire to assemble at richmond and take measures to withdraw the virginia troops and other support from resistance to the general government if they attempt it give them permission and protection until if at all they attempt some action hostile to the united states in which case you will notify them give them reasonable time to leave and at the end of which time arrest any who remain allow judge campbell to see this but do not make it public this document bears upon its face the distinct military object which the president had in view in permitting the rebel legislature to assemble namely to withdraw immediately the virginia troops from the army of lee then on its retreat towards lynchburg it could not be foreseen that lee would surrender the whole of that army within the next three days though it was evident that the withdrawal of the virginia forces from it under whatever pretended state authority would contribute to the ending of the war quite as effectually as the reduction to an equal extent of that army by battle or capture the ground upon which lincoln believed the rebel legislature might take this action is set forth in his dispatch to grant of the same date in which he wrote secretary seward was thrown from his carriage yesterday and seriously injured this with other matters will take me to washington soon i was at richmond yesterday and the day before when and where judge campbell who was with messrs hunter and stevens in february called on me and made such representations as induced me to put in his hands an informal paper repeating the propositions in my letter of instructions to mr seward which you remember and adding that if the war be now further persisted in by the rebels confiscated property shall at the least bear the additional cost and that confiscation shall be remitted to the people of any state which will now promptly and in good faith withdraw its troops and other support from the resistance to the government judge campbell thought it not impossible that the rebel legislature of virginia would do the latter if permitted and accordingly i addressed a private letter to general weitzel with permission for judge campbell to see it telling him general w that if they attempted this to permit and protect them 
unless they attempt something hostile to the united states in which case to give them notice and time to leave and to arrest any remaining after such time i do not think it very probable that anything will come of this but i have thought it best to notify you so that if you should see signs you may understand them from your recent dispatches it seems that you are pretty effectually withdrawing the virginia troops from opposition to the government nothing that i have done or probably shall do is to delay hinder or interfere with your work that mr lincoln well understood the temper of leading virginians when he wrote that he had little hope of any result from the permission he had given is shown by what followed when on the morning of april seventh general weitzel received the president's letter of the sixth he showed it confidentially to judge campbell who thereupon called together a committee apparently five in number of the virginia rebel legislature and instead of informing them precisely what lincoln had authorized namely a meeting to take measures to withdraw the virginia troops and other support from resistance to the general government the judge in a letter to the committee dated april seventh formulated quite a different line of action i have had since the evacuation of richmond two conversations with mr lincoln president of the united states the conversations had relation to the establishment of a government for virginia the requirement of oaths of allegiance from the citizens and the terms of settlement with the united states with the concurrence and sanction of general weitzel he assented to the application not to require oaths of allegiance from the citizens he stated that he would send to general weitzel his decision upon the question of a government for virginia this letter was received on thursday and was read by me the object of the invitation is for the government of virginia to determine whether they will administer laws in connection with the authorities of the united states i understand from mr lincoln if this condition be fulfilled that no attempt would be made to establish or sustain any other authority the rest of campbell's long letter related to safe conducts to transportation and to the contents of the written memorandum handed by lincoln to him at the interview on the malvern about general conditions of peace but this memorandum contained no syllable of reference to the government of virginia and bore no relation of any kind to the president's permission to take measures to withdraw the virginia troops except its promise that confiscations except in case of third-party intervening interests will be remitted to the people of any state which shall now promptly and in good faith withdraw its troops from further resistance to the government going a step further the committee next prepared a call inviting a meeting of the general assembly announcing the consent of the military authorities of the united states to the session of the legislature in richmond and stating that the matters to be submitted to the legislature are the restoration of peace to the state of virginia and the adjustment of questions involving life liberty and property that have arisen in the states as a consequence of the war when general weitzel endorsed his approval on the call for publications in the whig and in handbill form he does not seem to have read or if he read to have realized how completely president lincoln's permission had been changed and his authority perverted instead of permitting them to recall virginia soldiers weitzel was about to allow them authoritatively to sit in judgment on all the political consequences of the war in the states general weitzel's approval was signed to the call on april eleventh and it was published in the richmond whig on the morning of the twelfth on that day the president having returned to washington was at the war department writing an answer to a dispatch from general weitzel in which the general defended himself against the secretary's censure for having neglected to require from the churches in richmond prayers for the president of the united states similar to those which prior to the fall of the city had been offered up in their religious services in behalf of the rebel chief jefferson davis before he was driven from the capital weitzel contended that the tone of president lincoln's conversations with him justified the omission mr lincoln was never punctilious about social or official etiquette towards himself and he doubtless felt in this instance that neither his moral nor political well-being was seriously dependent upon the prayers of the richmond rebel churches to this part of the general's dispatch he therefore answered i have seen your dispatches to colonel hardy about the matter of prayers i do not remember hearing prayer spoken of while i was in richmond but i have no doubt that you acted in what appeared to you to be the spirit and temper manifested by me while there having thus generously assumed responsibility for weitzel's alleged neglect 
the president's next thought was about what the virginia rebel legislature was doing of which he had heard nothing since his return from city point he therefore included in this same telegram of april twelfth the following inquiry and direction is there any sign of the rebel legislature coming together on the understanding of my letter to you if there is any such sign inform me what it is if there is no such sign you may withdraw the offer to this question general weitzel answered briefly the passports have gone out for the legislature and it is common talk that they will come together it is probable that mr lincoln thought that if after the lapse of five days the proposed meeting had progressed no further than common talk nothing could be expected from it it would also seem that at this time he must have received either by telegraph or by mail copies of the correspondence and call which weitzel had authorized and which had been published that morning the president therefore immediately wrote and sent to general weitzel a long telegram in which he explained his course with such clearness that its mere perusal sets at rest all controversy respecting either his original intention of policy or the legal effect of his action and orders and by a final revocation of the permission he had given brought the incident to its natural and appropriate termination i have just seen judge campbell's letter to you of the seventh he assumes it appears to me that i have called the insurgent legislature of virginia together as the rightful legislature of the state to settle all differences with the united states i have done no such thing i spoke of them not as a legislature but as the gentlemen who have acted as the legislature of virginia in support of the rebellion i did this on purpose to exclude the assumption that i was recognizing them as a rightful body i dealt with them as men having power de facto to do a specific thing to wit to withdraw the virginia troops and other support from resistance to the general government for which in the paper handed to judge campbell i promised a special equivalent to wit a remission to the people of the states except in certain cases of the confiscation of their property i meant this and no more inasmuch however as judge campbell misconstrues this and is still pressing for an armistice contrary to the explicit statement of the paper i gave him and particularly as general grant has since captured the virginia troops so that giving a consideration for their withdrawal is no longer applicable let my letter to you and the paper to judge campbell both be withdrawn or countermanded and he be notified of it do not now allow them to assemble but if any have come allow them safe return to their homes end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter twelve johnston surrender sherman soon wearied of the civil administration of savannah and of the adjacent region of georgia which had suddenly grown loyal he received in january a visit from the secretary of war in which many matters pertaining to the care of captured property and the treatment of reclaimed territory were discussed and settled but the business which lay nearest to sherman's heart and occupied most of his time was the preparation for his march northward of five hundred miles which was to bring him in upon grant's left wing to finish the war either on the banks of the roanoke or the james he pushed forward with his accustomed untiring zeal the work required to put his magnificent army in position to traverse the wide pine barrens the spreading swamps and the deep rivers that lay between him and his goal and so rapid was his progress that he would have found himself ready to start by the middle of january had it not been for the torrents of rain which fell during that month swelling the savannah river out of its bed and flooding the rice-fields on its shore for miles around he made a lodgment meanwhile at pocotarligo where the railroad to charleston crosses the combahee meeting so little resistance as to convince him that there was a sensible diminution of the energy of the confederates 
the weather cleared away bright and cold at the end of january and with the opening days of february the great march to the north was begun howard commanded the right wing consisting of the fifteenth and seventeenth army corps under logan and blair slocum the left wing the fourteenth corps under jeff c davis and the twentieth under a s williams the cavalry was led by kilpatrick a grand total of sixty thousand men added to this grant had promised him important reinforcements on the way he had abundant stores with what he could collect on the march of food and forage and ammunition enough for a great battle fortunately this last was never to be used the whole campaign in fact is mainly interesting to the military student as one of the most remarkable marches which history records it amazed the confederate commanders that sherman should have thought of advancing before the waters subsided there is no account of another such march from savannah to goldsboro is a distance of four hundred and twenty-five miles the country is for the most part low and at that season wet intersected by innumerable rivers and streams bordered by swamps traversed by roads hardly deserving the name mere quaking causeways in a sea of mud the advance guard frequently waded through water waist deep the country was almost as destitute of maps as the region of the congo every step forward was made gropingly at the crossing of the Salkahatchee by logan's corps it was found the stream had fifteen channels all of which had to be bridged the roads were impassable to artillery or train wagons until corduroyed under the heavy weight the logs gradually sank till another layer was necessary and this toilsome process had to be repeated indefinitely bridging chaos for hundreds of miles as general cox calls it there are few instances of equal energy and success in the conquest of physical conditions general sherman himself when it was all over compared the march northward with the march to the sea in relative importance as ten to one he had little except the forces of nature to fight with on the way by skilfully feigning to right and left he produced the impression that both charleston and augusta were threatened while he marched almost unopposed to columbia charleston being thus turned fell like a ripe fruit into the hands of dahlgren and gilmore on the eighteenth of february general hardy hurrying northward to chira on the great p d there was nothing like organized resistance at the beginning of the march even at points where it was expected when howard drew near the railroad between charleston and augusta he paused to deploy his leading division to be ready for battle while thus engaged a man came galloping down the road whom he recognized as one of his own foragers on a white horse with a rope bridle shouting hurry up general we've got the railroads a vital line of communication had been captured by a squad of bummers while the generals were preparing for a serious battle beauregard and wade hampton who were both in columbia had neither the means nor the disposition to make any effectual resistance general sherman entered the place on the seventeenth of february that night a great part of the town was destroyed by fire ignited sherman says by the burning cotton bales which had been set on fire by the retreating confederates in spite of all that could be done to check the conflagration it raged all night and left the capital of south carolina a heap of ashes sherman did everything in his power to relieve the houseless and destitute people he provided shelter for many gave five hundred beef cattle to the mayor and took measures to maintain public order after the army should be gone he destroyed the railroad for many miles and after a halt of two days resumed his march to the north after leaving columbia the country was less difficult and the rate of progress more rapid with no more delay than was necessary to destroy the railroads of the state the army pushed on towards the great p d this was a most important stage in the journey sherman felt if he crossed that river prosperously there lay no serious obstacle before him south of the cape fear and that river he expected to find in the possession of the national forces 
hardy after evacuating charleston had established himself in formidable works at chara but sherman flanked him out of them with his left wing and the right wing under howard crossed the pd and took the town on the third of march with twenty-eight pieces of artillery three thousand small arms and a great quantity of stores hardy and hampton retreated rapidly to fayetteville on the cape fear sherman following with equal celerity entered that place on the eleventh and established communications with the splendid force which schofield had brought from tennessee to the north carolina coast at fayetteville sherman destroyed the arsenal with all its valuable machinery if he could have foreseen the speedy close of the war this would not have been done there was now apparently no obstruction to the concentration of all his forces at goldsboro a place of the utmost value and importance being the point where the railroads running from the coast to the tennessee mountains and from wilmington to richmond crossed each other to hold which was sooner or later to strangle the confederate army in virginia but sherman was not to accomplish this final stage of his last great march without meeting a more determined resistance than he had as yet encountered beauregard who was enfeebled by long illness in body and mind had been superseded on the twenty third of february by general joseph e johnston who had received from lee the comprehensive order to concentrate all available forces and drive back sherman he immediately assumed command not flattering himself that he could defeat his formidable adversary but determined to do everything in his power to keep his army together in such condition that when the end came he might obtain fair terms of peace his army though wholly inadequate to the task of driving back sherman was by no means contemptible it is almost impossible to determine with any accuracy the numbers of the confederates at this stage of the war jefferson davis general johnston and general beauregard differ widely but a careful examination of all their statements and reports indicates that johnston could command with hardee's troops and the remnants of what thomas had left on foot of hood's army something like thirty thousand men he had to give bragg a portion of this force to oppose the march of schofield from the coast and with the rest he did what he could to delay sherman's inevitable progress with the exception of occasional cavalry skirmishes of little importance in one of which on the tenth of march hampton surprised and came near capturing kilpatrick the two armies came into collision only twice at avery borough on the sixteenth of march slocum with the left wing found hardy entrenched between the cape fear and a neighboring swamp sherman riding with that wing personally directed the brief engagement which ensued hardy was driven from his position and retired in the night and sherman pursued his march going to the right to join howard general johnston having by this time come to the conclusion that sherman was moving upon goldsboro concentrated nearly all his force about twenty thousand men at bentonville where on the nineteenth a severe fight took place between him and slocum commanding the left wing of sherman's army slocum finding the enemy too strong in numbers and position to be swept aside reported the condition of things to sherman who instantly started for the scene of action bringing up his right wing to slocum's support he found johnston established on the south side of mill creek very much as hood had found schofield at franklin johnston's position was even stronger his whole left being covered by a brook running through a swamp which seemed at first sight impassable sherman found among his prisoners representatives of so many brigades and divisions the phantom relics of hood's army that he overestimated the numbers opposed to him and therefore instead of at once overpowering johnston's force he proceeded with unusual caution on the afternoon of the twenty first general joseph a mower who held the extreme right of the national line made his way with great boldness and skill through the difficult swamp in his front and with two brigades pushed close to the bridges in johnston's rear if he had been supported he could have cut off johnston's retreat but sherman did not think it wise to risk a general engagement at that moment and ordered mower to withdraw which he did under the fire of the forces which johnston hurriedly threw against him 
the day's work was the last fight of the two great armies it elated the confederates beyond what it was worth they cannot be made to believe to this day that mower withdrew under orders sherman in his memoirs blames himself for not having followed up mower's success but the result justified his wise forbearance the war ended just as soon as it would have done if he had plunged among the swampy thickets at bentonville and sacrificed thousands of lives in a murderous grapple with johnston's veterans johnston made good his retreat in the night and sherman hurried on to goldsboro he rode into the place at the head of his troops on the twenty third finding that schofield had arrived there the day before the grand junction was accomplished the great army of the west was once more united the heroes of franklin and nashville shook hands with those who had marched to the sea sherman with his ninety thousand veterans trained to marching and fighting under conditions before unknown to the world was henceforth not only invincible but irresistible the days of the confederacy were numbered when he rode into goldsboro there was nothing left to do but to gather up the fragments of the revolt from every quarter the triumphant legions of the union were moving to consummate victory at the same moment that the armies of sherman and schofield came together at goldsboro two splendidly equipped cavalry expeditions were moving east and south from thomas's department the one under j h wilson to the pacification of alabama the other under stoneman to destroy lee's last avenue of supply or escape in the mountainous region where the boundaries of virginia north carolina and tennessee come together thomas had already in the month of december sent stoneman with two brigades to sweep east tennessee clear of the enemy he then crossed over into virginia and descending the valley of the holston to saltville destroyed the extensive and valuable salt works at that place the iron manufactories at marion and the lead works of with county he drove breckinridge out of the country and into the secretaryship of war at richmond burnt bridges twisted rails and captured some guns and prisoners on the twenty second of march he started out again this time moving towards lynchburg to head off the expected retreat of lee he did not pursue his old track up the holston as there was a small confederate force along that river which might have delayed him but crossed the blue ridge by way of the watauga to the yadkin and thence turning sharply to the north reached withville without opposition here he destroyed a large depot of confederate supplies and rendered useless by the seventh of april some ninety miles of railroad to the west of lynchburg so that if lee had broken through sheridan's lines at appomattox he would have met capture or famine immediately beyond on the ninth not knowing what weighty transactions were making the day forever memorable stoneman pushed southward and on the twelfth defeated pemberton and gardner and captured salisbury north carolina with its enormous wealth of stores accumulated with the utmost toil and pain in the last throes of the confederacy as a reserve stock for lee's army he destroyed everything in accordance with his orders not aware of the situation which made this havoc unnecessary and went back to tennessee the ride of wilson's troopers into alabama was one of the most important and fruitful expeditions of the war and justified by its celerity its boldness and good judgment the high encomium with which grant sent wilson to thomas after the battle of nashville and the dispersion of hood's army wilson had passed the rest of the winter in drilling and equipping his force and he swung loose from the tennessee river on the twenty third of march with three fine divisions commanded by generals eli long emory upton and edward mccook a train of two hundred and fifty wagons especially adapted for rapid travelling and packed with small rations and ammunition he relied on the country for bread and meat arriving at jasper he received information of the movements of forrest who commanded the confederate forces in his front which determined him to sacrifice everything to swift marching 
he left his trains behind well guarded made his men fill their haversacks with food and pushed on with such relentless energy that the scattered detachments of force could make no stand nor accomplish any effective concentration against him he sent flying columns to the right and left to destroy public property and stores but led his main column so impetuously that even the energetic and rough-riding forest could nowhere turn long enough to fight at hillsborough wilson reached a bridge so hot on the heels of the enemy that they could not destroy it coming to montvallo on the thirty first he wrought great destruction of iron furnaces collieries in the few hours he could spare but still pushed forward driving the enemy who though constantly increased by additional detachments could not gain time enough to make an effectual resistance at last forrest having collected all his available force in a strong position at plantersville six miles north of selma gave battle for that important railroad and manufacturing centre and met with a total defeat his lines being broken and his forces driven helter-skelter into selma wilson wasted not an instant after his victory although it was won on a day in which he marched twenty-four miles at dawn on april two he closed in upon selma and spent the day establishing his lines and searching the works richard taylor had fled in the morning to demopolis intending to bring back a relieving force but it was not wilson's habit to allow time for this he assaulted the works late in the evening and carried them at every point after a hot but brief conflict forrest escaped in the confusion and joined a portion of his command which had been cut off at marion by wilson's swift marching if the confederacy had not been already wounded to death the loss of selma would have been almost irreparable their greatest manufacturing arsenal was there and enormous stores of every kind wilson after destroying everything which could be of advantage to the enemy moved east on macon georgia and it was reserved for a detachment of his troops to capture the fugitive confederate president on his flight towards the florida coast sherman returned to goldsboro from his journey to city point on the thirtieth of march he was able to come by rail from new Bern. so rapidly had the skill of his engineers repaired the ruined road he set himself at once to the reorganization of his army and the replenishment of his stores so as to be able to move by the tenth of april the day agreed upon with grant the day after the deluge as it turned out he still thought there was a hard campaign with desperate fighting before him he superseded williams by mower in command of the twentieth corps because he considered the latter superior in tactical fighting qualities with that vast army greater than grant's under him supplied now by rail from moorhead and wilmington with all that the nation's imperial wealth could afford with the broken rebellion tottering to its fall in every southern state he was still as careful and as laborious in every particular of his preparation for his next march as if he were beginning a great war with an equal adversary he had not comprehended the full measure of his own success so late as the twenty fourth of march he wrote to grant i feel certain from the character of the fighting that we have got johnston's army afraid of us as if that were not natural under the circumstances grant himself up to the last remained singularly modest and reserved in his expectations his mind was full of care on sherman's account during all his triumphal march northward when i hear that you and schofield are together he wrote with your back upon the coast i shall feel that you are entirely safe against anything the enemy can do safe with those armies the phrase does not sin by exaggeration even on the sixth of april when the news of the fall of richmond and the flight of lee and the confederate government towards danville reached goldsboro sherman was still unable to understand the full extent of the national triumph of course he says i inferred that general lee would succeed in making junction with general johnston with at least a fraction of his army somewhere to my front he admired and respected grant so far as a man might short of idolatry yet the long habit of respect for lee led him to think the confederates would somehow get away he had on the day before drawn up elaborate and detailed orders for the march which was to begin in earnest on the twelfth and be directed to warrenton near the roanoke river he now changed his plan and prepared to move straight upon johnston's army 
which was at smithville halfway to raleigh he started promptly on the morning of the tenth the next day he reached smithfield finding it abandoned johnston having retired to raleigh burning his bridges while these were repairing sherman received the great news from appomattox he issued a brief and sententious order in his happiest vein glory to god and our country he said and all honor to our comrades in arms towards whom we are marching a little more labor a little more toil on our part the great race is won and our government stands regenerated after four long years of war a young staff officer galloped along the lines of the army of the ohio shouting the glorious news to the troops who were lying at ease in the warm spring sunshine on either side of the road his words were received with wild rejoicing they meant peace an end of marching and battle an end of hatred and strife a return to home and its loves and duties the troops broke into strange antics eminent officers of the highest rank and dignity turned somersaults on the grass one soldier as he caught the shouted tidings yelled back at the galloping mercury you are the man we have been looking for these three years even the inhabitants of the country shared in the general joy the worn and weary women caught up their ragged children and cried now father will come home sherman definitely relieved from the apprehension of a junction of the confederate armies had now no fear except of a flight and dispersal of johnson's force into guerrilla bands if they ran away he felt he could not catch them the country was too open for that they could scatter and meet again at a pointed rendezvous and continue a partisan warfare indefinitely he could not be expected to know that this resolute enemy who had met him on a hundred fields with such undaunted valor was sick to the heart of war and longing for peace the desire for more fighting survived only in a group of fugitive politicians flying from a danger which did not exist through the pine forests and woodlands of the carolinas entering raleigh on the morning of the thirteenth sherman turned his heads of column in the direction of salisbury and charlotte hoping to cut off this southward march of johnston he made no great haste for thinking johnston superior to him in cavalry he wanted sheridan to arrive before pushing the confederates to extremities he tried to persuade the civil authorities at raleigh to remain at their posts but the governor zebulon b vance had fled fearing arrest and imprisonment the next day kilpatrick who was far in front with the cavalry reported that a flag of truce had arrived with a communication from general johnston it reached sherman in raleigh it was dated the thirteenth of april and was in these words the results of the recent campaign in virginia have changed the relative military condition of the belligerents i am therefore induced to address you in this form the inquiry whether in order to stop the further effusion of blood and devastation of property you are willing to make a temporary suspension of active operations and to communicate to lieutenant-general grant commanding the armies of the united states the request that he will take like action in regard to other armies the object being to permit the civil authorities to enter into the needful arrangements to terminate the existing war this proposition which was simply for an armistice to enable the national and the confederate governments to negotiate on equal terms had been dictated by jefferson davis who had then reached greensboro on his flight southward written down by s r mallory and merely signed and sent by general johnston it was inadmissible even offensive in its terms but general sherman anxious for peace and incapable of discourtesy to a brave enemy took no notice of its language and answered at once in terms so unreserved and so cordial that they probably encouraged the confederates to ask for better conditions of surrender than they had expected to receive i am fully empowered he said to arrange with you any terms for the suspension of further hostilities between the armies commanded by you and those commanded by myself and will be willing to confer with you to that end he gave notice that he would limit his advance to certain points and asked johnston to stay in his present position pending negotiations he suggested the appomattox conditions as a basis of action and promised to obtain from grant and stoneman a suspension of hostilities johnston who after sending his letter had marched with his army towards greensboro received sherman's reply on the sixteenth when he was within a few miles of that place 
he hurried to greensboro to submit the letter to jefferson davis who was the real principal so far in the negotiation but found that he had started for charlotte and johnston therefore arranged a meeting for noon the next day the seventeenth at the house of a mr bennett on the raleigh road the two great antagonists who had dealt each other so many sturdy blows during two years at last met not without emotion which was heightened by sherman's communicating to johnston the news he had that morning received of the murder of mr lincoln the confederate general expressed his unfeigned sorrow at this calamity which smote the south he said as deeply as the north and in this mood of sympathy the discussion began sherman said frankly that he could not recognize the confederate civil authority as having any existence and could neither receive nor transmit to washington any proposition coming from them he expressed his ardent desire for an end to devastation and offered johnston the same terms offered by grant to lee johnston replied that he would not be justified in such a capitulation but suggested that they might arrange the terms of a permanent peace the suggestion pleased general sherman the prospect of ending the war without the shedding of another drop of blood was so tempting to him that he did not sufficiently consider the limits of his authority in the matter and besides his heart was melted at the sight of his gallant adversary so completely at his mercy he afterwards said in his report of the transaction to push an army whose commander had so frankly and honestly confessed his inability to cope with me were cowardly and unworthy of the brave men i led questions arising as to a general amnesty and as to the power of johnston to bring about the surrender of the confederate forces in texas consumed the afternoon and the generals parted to meet the next day general sherman going back to raleigh found all his general officers eagerly in favor of the negotiations he had begun and thus confirmed in his own prepossessions he renewed the discussion at noon on the eighteenth here he committed a grave error in assenting to johnston's proposition to introduce john c breckinridge into the discussion not as secretary of war they agreed but as an officer of the general staff regan the confederate postmaster-general who was somewhere in the background sent in a written scheme of capitulation which johnston read as a basis of agreement sherman at last after listening to a speech by breckinridge seized a pen and wrote with an ease and rapidity which surprised johnston the following memorandum of agreement one the contending armies now in the field to maintain the status quo until notice is given by the commanding general of any one to its opponent and reasonable time say forty-eight hours allowed two the confederate armies now in existence to be disbanded and conducted to their several state capitals there to deposit their arms and public property in the state arsenal and each officer and man to execute and file an agreement to cease from acts of war and to abide the action of the state and federal authority the number of arms and munitions of war to be reported to the chief of ordnance at washington city subject to the future action of the congress of the united states and in the meantime to be used solely to maintain peace and order within the borders of the states respectively three the recognition by the executive of the united states of the several state governments on their officers and legislatures taking the oaths prescribed by the constitution of the united states and where conflicting state governments have resulted from the war the legitimacy of all shall be submitted to the supreme court of the united states for the re-establishment of all the federal courts in the several states with powers as defined by the constitution of the united states and of the states respectively five the people and inhabitants of all the states to be guaranteed so far as the executive can their political rights and franchises as well as their rights of person and property as defined by the constitution of the united states and of the states respectively six the executive authority of the government of the united states not to disturb any of the people by reason of the late war so long as they live in peace and quiet abstain from acts of armed hostility and obey the laws in existence at the place of their residence seven in general terms the war to cease a general amnesty so far as the executive of the united states can command on condition of the disbandment of the confederate armies the distribution of the arms and the resumption of peaceful pursuits by the officers and men hitherto composing said armies 
not being fully empowered by our respective principles to fulfil these terms we individually and officially pledge ourselves to promptly obtain the necessary authority and to carry out the above programme this agreement was signed by the two generals thus the wisdom of lincoln's peremptory order to grant of the third of march was completely vindicated no general in the field could be trusted to make terms of peace involving the future relations of the states with the national government on the confederate side in this affair the military commander had completely effaced himself while general sherman who had begun most properly with the offer of grant's terms at appomattox had in the two days negotiations set on foot by jefferson davis and carried on by regan and breckinridge ended by making a treaty of peace with the confederate states but two things must always be said in his defence neither the government nor general grant had ever communicated to him the president's instructions of the third of march forbidding grant to decide discuss or to confer upon any political question a neglect for which both were to blame secondly grant in overstepping his powers by granting pardon and amnesty to all the officers of lee's army had naturally created in sherman's mind the impression that he might with equal propriety venture upon the exercise of similar powers he says also in justification of his action that mr stanton when at savannah had spoken of the terrible financial strain of the war and had made him believe that the termination of this waste was an object so desirable that great sacrifices should be made to obtain it but when all possible explanations have been made the fact remains that general sherman though perfectly loyal and subordinate to the civil authorities so far as obedience to orders was concerned ready to lay down his life at any moment at their command had the low opinion of civilians which is so common to soldiers and thought the generals in the field more competent to make peace or war than the politicians in washington a year before he had said to grant even in the seceded states your word now would go further than a president's proclamation or an act of congress and now three days after this agreement had been dispatched to washington for approval he returned to the political aspect of the matter in a letter to johnston referring to the question of slavery and saying although strictly speaking this is no subject of a military convention yet i am honestly convinced that our simple declaration of a result will be accepted as good law everywhere of course i have not a single word from washington on this or any other point of our agreement but i know the effect of such a step by us will be universally accepted on the same day these confident words were written the text of the agreement arrived in washington the moment grant read it he saw that it was entirely inadmissible he submitted it to president johnson the cabinet was hastily called together and the whole negotiation disapproved general grant was ordered to give sherman notice of the disapproval and to direct him to resume hostilities at once lincoln's instructions of the third of march were repeated somewhat tardily it must be confessed to sherman as his rule of action all this was a matter of course and even general sherman could not properly and perhaps would not have objected to it but the calm spirit of lincoln was now absent from the councils of the government and it was not in andrew johnson and mr stanton to pass over a mistake like this even in the case of one of the most illustrious captains of the age they ordered grant to proceed at once to sherman's headquarters and to direct operations against the enemy and what was worse than all mr stanton printed in the newspapers of the country the reasons of the government for disapproving the agreement expressed in terms of the sharpest censure of general sherman this publication did not for some weeks come under general sherman's eye general grant arrived at sherman's headquarters on the twenty fourth and made known to him the government's disapproval of his proceedings sherman with prompt obedience announced the fact to johnston demanded the surrender of his immediate command on the appomattox terms pure and simple and gave forty-eight hours notice of the termination of the truce general johnston had already received on the same day from mr davis at charlotte the approval of the confederate government for the convention of the eighteenth mr davis before giving his consent to the agreement required from general breckinridge his secretary of war a report as to the desirability of ratifying the convention this report set forth the desperate condition of affairs the favorable terms proposed the impossibility of negotiations on equal terms he therefore advised mr davis to execute the convention so far as it was in his power and to recommend its acceptance by the states and finally to return to the states and the people the trust which you are no longer able to defend 
thinking the war at an end johnston had drawn from the treasury agent in his camp the sum of thirty nine thousand dollars in silver which he distributed among his troops each man an officer getting a dollar so far as he was concerned the war was certainly over for he could no longer hold his troops together eight thousand of them left their camps and went home in the week of the truce many of them riding away on the artillery horses and train mules when johnston communicated to mr davis the failure of his negotiations and asked instructions the confederate president suggested that he disband the infantry with instructions to come together at some rendezvous and try to escape with the cavalry and light guns this futile and selfish direction general johnston deliberately and wisely refused to obey he told general breckinridge plainly that this plan contemplated merely the safety of the high civil functionaries and made no provision for the protection of the people and the prevention of bloodshed among the soldiers he counseled the immediate flight of president davis and added commanders believe the troops will not fight again thinking it would be a great crime to prolong the war he therefore assumed the responsibility of making an end of strife and answered sherman's summons by inviting another conference at bennett's house where the two commanders met on the twenty sixth of april and johnston surrendered all the confederate forces in his command which in territory happened to be co-extensive with that of sherman on the same terms granted lee at appomattox by a supplemental agreement schofield allowed the confederates the use of their field transportation to get to their homes and for use on their farms each brigade to retain one-seventh of their arms till they arrived at the capital of their state officers and men to retain their own horses and property general canby was requested to give water transportation to those living beyond the mississippi besides this sherman when he was informed by the confederate commander that his supplies were exhausted gave him two hundred and fifty thousand rations never was a beaten enemy treated so like a friend sherman instantly made the orders necessary for closing up the work in his department and for starting the troops on their march homeward the paroling of the confederate force occupied about a week thirty seven thousand officers and men were paroled in north carolina and these were exclusive of the thousands who deserted their camps during the suspension of hostilities some sixty thousand surrendered as reported by wilson in georgia and florida general johnston closes his account of this transaction with these generous words as creditable to him as to those of whom he writes the united states troops that remained in the southern states on military duty conducted themselves as if they thought that the object of the war had been the restoration of the union they treated the people around them as they would have done those of ohio or new york if stationed among them as their fellow-citizens sherman did not pretend to relish or approve the decision of the government in regard to his diplomacy he submitted like a soldier carried out his orders punctually but he said to stanton plainly that the government had made a mistake he wrote on the twenty fifth to grant then present with him at headquarters i now apprehend that the rebel armies will disperse and instead of dealing with six or seven states we will have to deal with numberless bands of desperadoes headed by such men as mosby forrest red jackson and others who know not and care not for danger and its consequences he did not know that forrest had at last got all the fighting he wanted at wilson's hands and that mosby was soon to be a federal office holder sherman was preparing to go to savannah to direct the further operations of wilson's cavalry when on the twenty eighth he received a new york paper containing stanton's bulletin in regard to his convention with johnston this naturally roused him to great wrath he wrote an eloquent and fiery defence of his conduct to grant but hastened on his journey to savannah nevertheless made all needful provision for wilson and then returned to find still further cause of indignation general grant had transferred his headquarters to washington and halleck had been made commander of the armies of the potomac and the james in this capacity filled with new zeal on the occasion of the johnston convention halleck had ordered meade's army disregarding the truce to push forward against johnston and to attack him regardless of sherman's orders these orders though they were nullified by the surrender had injudiciously been published this new insult completed the measure of sherman's anger he broke out into open defiance of the authorities who he thought were persecuting him with deliberate malice and declared in a report to grant that he would have maintained his truce at any cost of life 
when grant suggested that this was uncalled for and offered him an opportunity to correct the report sherman refused to do so avowing his readiness to obey all future orders of the president and the general but insisting that his record should stand as written he declined to meet halleck in richmond and warned him to keep out of his way and on arriving in washington publicly refused the proffered hand of stanton at the grand review of the armies End of chapter twelve